collected the items you wanted to sign on auction to collect those as soon as you can after after this program of course and uh, so we can settle up with uh, our people down the way numbers 88 72 157 number one 159 24 and 25 need to address that issue <laughs> and we also have some un we also have some unsold items that are going for rock bottom prices, <laughs> <laughs> including a slate. <laughs> Don't make me use this on you. So much. It's turned into an auction. <laughs> okay, one more announcement. This one's from Betsy Epley. Um, she says that. We at the LMI would like to know about and have copies of any Montgomery thesis, theses, I have to pronounce that very carefully, um, that feature Montgomery. So please reach out to me or Kate Spark or Emily or Betsy or Philip if you have a thesis that is related. The other thing to mention is we have Rod Drew with us today and this. Session is going to be live streamed. Um, we did this last year. I was live streamed, and little did I know that it would be captured and kept on the Montgomery website forever. <laughs> uh, so, warning, Emily. <laughs> but uh, so that's great. And it, I'm Laura Robinson. Um, some of you know that already. Um, and it's my absolute honor to uh, introduce Emma Wilster today. Emily is the current visiting scholar for the Alan Montgomery Institute and assistant professor in the Department of English, Linguistics, and Writing Studies at the University of Minnesota Duluth. She completed her PhD in English Studies with specializations in children's literature and women's, women's writing at the Illinois State University in 2013. She has served on committees for the Children's Literature Association and has recently pursued a passion for faculty and teaching development at UMD. Emily's research has focused primarily on the reading lives and textual worlds of Ellen Montgomery, including a chapter in Ellen Montgomery's Rainbow Valleys, the Ontario years. Her broader research interests straddle the worlds between women's life writing, children's literature, and English studies. She is managing editor of AB, Autobiographical Studies, and will be co-editor of the new journal of Ellen Montgomery Studies. She's also the co-chair of this conference, mm -hmm. and I can't even begin to tell you, although I'm sure you can all imagine, what an absolute joy it has been to work with Emily on uh, organizing this conference. <laughs> Ever kind, clever, quick problem solving, and can slap anything into an Excel spreadsheet. <laughs> <laughs> Which is awesome. Her positivity has completely set the tone for this conference, and you are all feeling it, I'm sure. So please join me in welcoming Emily, who will be speaking on Alan Montgomery, The Reading of a Lifetime. Um, there's more Excel spreadsheets to comment on. <laughs> Can you all hear me in the back? I'm too tall for all podiums, so I don't want to have to do this. Can you hear me? Right. So, my life of reading always returns to Montgomery. Most of you already know my Montgomery origin story, as most of you knew my mother, who made avoiding Montgomery nearly impossible. <laughs> well, wholly impossible, really. That's my sister Anne. Uh, that's me with Anne and Gilbert. And that is approximately one one thousandth of Mom's incredible Montgomery collection. 
My first conference paper, a project I completed as a starry-eyed undergraduate researcher who came to this very conference for the first time and realized exactly what I wanted to be when I grew up, was about Montgomery's reading responses in the first volume of the published Selected Journals. I innocently surmised that Montgomery was continually creating a series of imaginary literary landscapes, this was from the conference being at the time, to which she retreated via her reading. And I've been playing around with Montgomery's reading life ever since, exploring different theoretical frameworks and scholarly traditions that provide me new ways of seeing how her reading responses work. After years of graduate work on this aspect of Montgomery, and after the loss of my amazing mother, and after being appointed visiting scholar, I decided that the best way to recharge and really find my voice would be to do what I tell my students to do every day, and that is to return to the text. So over the last few months or so, I have begun, in chronological order, mind you, to reread every word that Montgomery wrote. <laughs> every text I can get my grubby little hands on, I am re-rereading. I'm starting with everything from 1889, 1890, 1891, and then, and then. Journals, letters, essays, short stories, poems, interviews, scrapbook material, all as close to chronological order as possible. And I know that's impossible, but I'm doing my best. I'm keeping a reading journal of sorts to note larger shifts in my thinking or Montgomery's. I'm noting places where I hadn't left notes during my previous readings. Mm -hmm. And this exercise, despite all my past work, has surprised even me, who has spent the last decade plus thinking about Montgomery as a reader, thinker, rereader, particularly in the way these roles influence and define her autobiographical tendencies. At the same time, though, I've been revisiting my own Montgomery scholarship in an attempt to follow the threads I had picked up and analyzed and dropped along the way in order to determine my final findings about Montgomery and reading. Hence, the purposefully ambiguous title of this paper. I'm referring to both Montgomery's lifetime of reading and my own. So what I would like to do in this talk is, on one hand, finally provide some kind of ending, and that's in air quotes because we know nothing with Montgomery has an ending, <laughs> to the work that I began long ago, and review some of the patterns and practices of Montgomery's life as a reader, alongside some of my former observations about them. In putting all this together, I have confronted a couple narratives that have kind of sprouted up um, with, uh, with us as readers and that, that we've built around Montgomery and her works. On the other hand, I would like to offer an interesting new beginning, one that I hope will prove useful to other Ellen Montgomery researchers and perhaps change some of our conversations about the absolute wealth of Montgomery material available to us. The result of both of these exercises is that I am refining the project I started years ago and finally creating a full and complete as possible record, database, what, whatever you want to call it, of Montgomery's reading life as we can know it. More on that later, so buckle up. <laughs> And just a quick aside to ground some of my methods here and why I'm building this, this paper the way I am. Since on the surface it might not seem methodologically sound to be gathering up Montgomery's reading or cataloging it or quantifying it or even analyzing it simultaneously with my own past work. But if there's one thing I've learned over my years of Montgomery study and my theorizing about archives and autobiography is that there is not an archive without an archiver. In other words, I can't help but, and in fact should, do this work simultaneously, and present it to you together. As Beverly Skaggs argued in the Introduction to Feminist Cultural Theory, quote, if as feminists have argued all research is situated and peer objectivity is a pretense, it is ethically and politically right that feminist researchers should lead the way in coming clean on the way research is produced and lived. She says, what is happening now is a methodological concern to reveal the complex autobiographical underpinnings of feminist research, as opposed to continuing to assume that our work, or such work that I'm doing, is pure and cold, and that the data we uncover remains unadulterated by our manipulation of it. Skeggs argues for the pointed and purposeful position, or, or location, or identification of the researcher and her social position. She goes so far as to suggest a list of autobiographical questions for a researcher to ask herself, questions that she should confront and consider, if not explicitly discuss, in her research. Why was this area of study chosen? Which methods were chosen for study and why? What, why were other approaches not used? How did the process of writing influence the final product? So if I'm going to make any qualitative or even quantitative judgments about Montgomery's reading practices, 
Certainly, I must consider my own answers to these questions and explain my reading along with Montgomery's. So, here we go. <laughs> Montgomery's early reading life is marked by her first unconsciously, whoops, I think I skipped a stage. Back up one. As an indefatigable rereader of texts and reviser of her own writing, Montgomery's canon is a tangle of textual references, allusions, revisions, and reconsiderations. And re, re, re revisions. <laughs> I have mined that lifetime of reading to redefine her autobiographical methods and what I call an autobibliography in my past work. Now, unlike Margaret Mackey's definition of autobibliography, I was focused more on the auto of someone else, the self of someone else. But in the end, my current rereading project, with my slow progress from 1889 onward, has really reinforced the three major periods of Montgomery's life as I define them in my dissertation. Though my dissertation really only focused on the journals themselves and a few letters with one short foray into the fiction. This current project has, I think, proved me right about those three periods. Fancy that, I proved myself right. <laughs> <laughs> I can do that. But, but also added some dimension to my initial findings. Even given that, at this point in my research, I am more concerned with how Montgomery read than what she read. These major periods mark geographical and emotional, psychological moves in Montgomery's life that inform her writing and reading processes, but also mark distinct periods in her relationship to text. Similarly, I did a little inventory of my own thinking about Montgomery. <laughs> all the papers there, and found that I too have been considering her life in those three distinct units from her intellectual or even outside my dissertation. I was unconsciously pulling from those three distinct periods. So I will walk through those three periods of textual work from her intertextual beginnings on PEI from 1889 to 1911, her productive, self-reflective, auto-bibliographical years in Leesdale from 1911 to 1926, and her final archival preserve and revisit and reminisce about text years from 1926 to 1942. So Montgomery's early reading life is marked by her first unconscious, compulsively intertextual instincts. Many of you have heard me speak on this before, so I'm not gonna belabor this too much, but that she quotes and alludes to things in the early journals, less so during her year in Prince Albert, and devotes her first entire journal entry to reading in 1892. She writes a clubbing with a friend in order to send away for books, from a mail order book club. She is the book drunkard we all know and love. <laughs> she begins sharing pointed opinions about her reading. Even the 1903 secret diary Montgomery kept with Nora Lefergy can be read as an elusive journaling experiment. Uh, elusive, not elusive. The secret diary is punctuated by Montgomery and Lefergy's shared reading experiences, snippets of poetry, and mentions of Montgomery's literary ambitions. As in her personal journals, I'm oh, sorry. As in a personal journal, Montgomery's reading bubbles up to the surface of this writing exercise. Montgomery admits in a secret journal, I am full of illusions, as if she cannot help but quote and utilize the work of other writers in her own texts. In 1902, Montgomery admits to her journal that her journal itself, her largest textual undertaking, was inspired by childhood reading. She describes a bad boy's diary by a Victoria Fuller Victor. She says, today I have laughed more than I've done for a month together. I've been rereading A Bad Boy's Diary, and she spells diary like the boy does in the text, D-I-R-Y. Mm -hmm. That book is responsible for you, my journal. For us, it was from it that I first got the idea of keeping a diary. When I was about nine years old, Mr. Fraser, the Cavendish school teacher who boarded at our place, had the book. I think I regarded it as a classic then. I read it and reread it and promptly began a diary, D-I-R-Y. I folded and cut and sewed four sheets of foolscap into a book and covered it with red paper. On the cover, I wrote Maud Montgomery's Diary. But years ago, I burned it in one of my iconoc iconoclastic fits. It was a pity for it really should have been preserved as one of the curiosities of literature. <laughs> Clearly, reading and interacting with that reading is foundational to Montgomery's identity. It inspires opinions and action and feeling throughout the journal. Now, obviously, I've skipped over a whole bunch of things that happened between 1889 and 1911. I have a few scrapbooks and letters to comb through to add to this initial skimmed list of autobiographical texts. But I think that all of the above, the work that Montgomery created before 1911, reflects the same intertextual impulse. 
the same need to capture an experience with text, to record her often strong reactions, to manipulate and rework text, all practice for other intertextual experiments to come in her own fiction. And this, of course, leads us to Anne, the first novel-length illustration of her intensely intertextual style, the direct result of her previous reading life. Elizabeth Watterson reads, quote, many literary antecedents in Anne's story. Betsy Epperly argues that this first book is deeply influenced by her past reading, and it draws from Shakespeare and Milton and all these other texts. Montgomery, this is from Betsy, Montgomery drew her ideas about narration, description, dialogue, dialect, and moral rectitude. Much is written about Anne and Elaine and all of the other intertextual references that the novel implies, if not explicitly, quotes. I should note here that some of the data I'm about to discuss or share comes courtesy of Rhea Wilmshurst, to whom I'm deeply indebted for her work on cataloging the literary references in Montgomery's novels in the 80s and 90s beginning with an article about Anne, the Anne series, I should say, in Canadian children's literature in 1989. I've been granted access to her research on the other novels and been able to expand on and work with her initial lists and some of the new annotated editions of some of the novels from Rock Snow's Press have sort of added some dimension to that. Um, Anne of Avonlea, Kill Me of the Orchard, and The Story Girl all demonstrate some of the same intertextual tendencies employed in Anne of Green Gables and even in her journal. Episodes in Anne of Avonlea are adapted from other short stories. Kilmany is a novelization of a serial um, published as Una in the Garden, and each contain a host of other literary references and allusions. The Story Girl contains 101 separate citations and references, perhaps as a reflection of the variety of Sarah's stories. What does all this mean? Well, to me, it means that both her life, in both her life writing and her fiction, Montgomery was learning how to craft both her intertextual and just textual, textual voice. And my past research on this period argues that one of the pitfalls of studying Montgomery's intertextuality is the tendency to assume that studying allusions as sources, and phrased that way, provides a full picture of Montgomery's reading. But as John Stevens asserts in Ideology and Children's Fiction, intertext and intertextuality are, quote, not to be confused with mere source, source study. Rather, they are concerned with how meaning is produced at points of interaction. I am intensely interested in the kind of textual labor that is represented by both the impersonal nature of her reading responses and, and illusions, impersonal in light of the sometimes casual or even unintentional nature of those illusions, and the intimately personal evidence of that reading in light of the kind of reading she does and the means in which she recorded it. Montgomery provides a dynamic example of an intertextual reader-writer. She consciously quotes her favorite works, unconsciously cites past reading, records pages of extended discussion with and reviews of books, and adapts and transforms text throughout her fiction. That first conference paper I mentioned in dealing with Montgomery's literary landscapes seemed so close to discussing the nexus of connections, the web, the weave of an intertextual writer like Montgomery. And the origin of the word text is tissue or something woven. Um, text is something woven, and Montgomery, I think, was a master weaver. She turned to text to consume and create. So it is perhaps not surprising that Montgomery's reading shifts and changes during the least early years. In these 15 years, and I think it's important to list all of these things so we can really feel the pressure of it in those 15 years, she adjusts to the life of a Presbyterian minister's wife and its attendant duties, gives birth to three sons, one stillborn, struggles through and is forever changed by World War I, first deals with her husband's formerly latent mental illness, loses her closest friend, cousin, to the influenza epidemic of 1919, wins a protracted and publicly humiliating lawsuit against her first American publisher, endures the public scrutiny of another suit brought against her husband after a car accident, debates and worries about the Canadian church union, and, big old and, produces and publishes more writing than during any other period. Mm -hmm. Six novels, one volume of poetry, two collections of short stories, an autobiography, and countless poems and short stories for the magazine market. <laughs> yeah. Montgomery faithfully and sometimes painfully records all of these events in her journals, her scrapbooks, her letters, and even her the photographs, and even in her own books in her own library, all exposing the transformations Montgomery undergoes during her years of these stills. And another and she copies out the previous years of her journal into uniform volumes, illustrating them with photographs. 
I mean, I can't imagine. <laughs> my dissertation argued that it was the recopying of the journals that most tellingly reveals Montgomery's attention to autobiographical work, as she spent so much time in Leesdale rereading herself. My current chronological look at her canon will reinforce much of that work, and in general, the Leesdale years suggest that her reading became an autobiographical act. On December 13, 1919, Montgomery writes, the truth is, I am starving for a little companionship. For eight weeks, I've been mute up here with, without one living soul near me who is any kin whatsoever to the race that knows Joseph. He went in his present quiet, dull state of mind is rather worse than no company at all. I'm so utterly alone, and once in a while, when a dull, lifeless twilight is wrapping itself over a dull, lifeless gray world, I give up in a sort of despair and mutter, I can't go on. But my giving's up on her would last very long. When I get rested and cheered up by a bit of a dip into some interesting book, or even a dose of confession in this, my diary, I rise up again and resolve to endure to the end. This little outburst here has quite refreshed me. Some of you have heard me read that quote before, but I think it highlights that text consumption and then creation, both solitary, reflective, personal activities, work together and shape her identity and shape the way she shapes it in the journal. Now, I don't have time here to cover every piece of evidence that Montgomery's reading in Leesdale is part and parcel of her journaling and autobiography, but I can provide a few notable ones. She continually used quotations and allusions rather than her own literary talent to record certain life events. In 1924, after the McDonald's visit of Mammoth Cave, she tells her journal, quote, it cannot be described, or she goes and does something. But perhaps she meant that she herself, in that moment, couldn't describe it, because in her letter to uh, Ephraim Weber about the experience, she uses lines from Paradise Lost in order to do so. On November 11, 1918, she uses Byron's lines to Napoleon to su summarize her thoughts on how the world will remember the Kaiser. Art now, thou art, uh, art now thou art a nameless thing, so abject yet alive. In February 1924, she rereads Bulwer Lytton's Zanoni. It was a child childhood favorite, and she pauses in her regular journaling to discuss how she first came by the book and to relate her, ex or relate her expectations for this adult rereading. I read the book with just the same pleasure as in those old years, with just the same sense of enchantment. The magic door still swung open, and through it, I still made my escape from the read. I love, enjoyed, and sorrowed with the characters as keenly as ever, and as ever, the pathos of that last interview between Zanoni and Viola in the prison cell of the terror, it doesn't sound great, left me in a passion of tears. Over a few pages of the ledger journal, she copies out a ton of beautiful sentences from the novel, um, so smiles the eternal nature on the wrecks of all that make life glorious. <laughs> Some she lists from memory, presumably you just copied out quickly, they're almost stream of consciousness when you look at the handwriting. And with others, she includes a bit of commentary. The entry overall marks a turning point in the story that Montgomery is creating of and for herself. She as a, is at once remembering her past reading life, reflecting on her present, and painting a picture of who she really is in the journal, all via a single reading experience. Cavendish is a frequent destination of these literary tours of her memory. And for example, she is able to get a copy of um, something called Girl in a Jewel from Wide Awake magazine in 1916. She reads it to the boy, or she reads it um, out loud, and then she, she says she never finished reading the story in childhood, but was finally offered a chance when she came across a whole stack of the, the magazines. She says, it is impossible to tell how much I enjoyed rereading them and what delight they gave me. A strange, eerie pleasure, as if a journey back into the past. As I read, I seemed to be back again in the surroundings of the days in which I read them first. I was back in the old home in Cavendish. Grandfather and grandmother and Dave and Well were there. A world utterly passed away as my universe was my universe once more. I felt curiously homesick and strange every time I shut the book and came back to this one. Another example, after reading Miss As Asquith's biography, which begins with a really long, painfully detailed description of Mrs. As Asquith, Montgomery attempts the same thing herself. I am of medium height, about five foot five inches, but somehow usually impress people as being small, probably because I am delicate featured. And it goes on for pages of my new description of her nose and her ears and her clothes and everything. 
On discussing the use of airplanes during World War I, she adds a few misquoted lines from Thomas Gray's The Progress of Poesy in her journal. This is what she, how she writes it. With the majesty of pinion, which, which the even eagles bear, sailing with supreme dominion through the azure fields of air. She gives the same line to Anne, her living beside, and repeats them, I think, in letters to Macmillan. The real lines are nor the pride nor ample pinion that even eagles bear, sailing with supreme dominion through the azure deep of air. But I actually think she might really be misquoting Thackeray's slight misquote from, Pe from Pendennis. The line is, fancy you have the strength and pinion which the Theban eagles bear, sailing with supreme dominion through the azure fields of air. No, my boy, I think you can write a magazine article and turn out a pretty copy of verses. That's what I think of you. <laughs> Research on the reading lives of many authors show that literary references give these readers the tools to control, name, and order events in their lives. Judy Simons argues that the journals of literary and other women show how their days and their thoughts were dominated by the ideas and practice of literary activity. Thus, Montgomery's reading is purposeful and very, very personal. And I, I dealt with that in lots of different ways, and I haven't even scratched the surface, surface of the least stale um, essays and interviews that came out during the Montgomery readers recently, because they are elusive as well. Mm -hmm. Montgomery uses the autobiographical genres at her disposal, journal, letter, book, scrapbook, as a means to continue reading and forego the inevitable closing of the book. Now, I haven't walked, worked through every page of these, but my past work on this period has reinforced this autobiographical turn to her reading. Hence, I've argued that Montgomery's simultaneous, or overlapping perhaps, bit of a dip into an interesting book and dose of confession in this, my diary, invite scholars to reconsider both actions as the ways they are generative of one another. Montgomery's autobiographic work compels us to consider our own reading writing methodologies as she reveals her own. In my contribution to Ella Montgomery's Rainbow Valleys, I argued that one of Montgomery's most powerful autobiographical tools is textual, not just experiential or cultural or visual, or even historical, and I think that's a significant statement about her reading and autobiographical lives and how she records and presents them. Um, and what I said, in, I also said in Rainbow Valley is contextualizing reading is perhaps a way to read the auto and the bio through the graphy, the self and the, um, as influenced by other bibliographies of women's work. So finally, 1926 to 1942. In the summer of 1926, the McDonald's left to be still for Norval, Ontario. In 1935, they relocated again to Western Ontario, or Western Toronto. In the midst of these transitions, Montgomery published short stories, nine additional novels, and received multiple professional accolades for her contributions to Canadian literature. And I would argue that this final period seems to be about closing off her previous literary textual connections and tidying up the textual work of a lifetime in order to control her professional reputation and literary legacy. First, her fiction during this period shifts over time, from intertextually rich novels reminiscent of her early work to somewhat formulaic stories that rework and retell <coughs> other previous or published stories. The allusions in this fiction, like the novels themselves, seem to reflect Montgomery's sentimental longing for a lost world, as Rubio and Watterson called it in the introduction to the fourth volume of Selected Journals. The Blue Castle, 1926, Emily's Quest, 27, and Magic for Miracle, 29, are more typical of her previous work. All include numerous allusions and feature heroines who read or are informed by literature. They are intertextually rich and suggest that Montgomery was still reveling in the joy of textual work, as she ha had in her early fictional enterprises. In Blue Castle, draws from Shakespeare, Milton, Wordsworth, and the Bible, and of course the entire title is um, built around Irving's Alhambra. But it is not in Montgomery's return to the Anne series that this literary retreat into memory become, comes full circle. Anne of Wendy Poplar's 36, Anne of Ingleside, 1939, and the posthumously published The Blides Are Quoted are clearly attempts to revisit and remember her most famous character and no longer engage with other texts quite so dramatically. Anne of Ingleside includes very few, as a few offhand, literary references in the first 80 pages except for references to earlier episodes in the Anne series. The book opens with Anne and her bosom friend Diana actually walking through spaces in Avonlea, the town Anne moved away from upon her marriage. 
Anne expects to see the Anne who used to be somewhere along their ramble. She tells Diana that they will see all the old familiar things they loved and the hills where they will find their youth again. I see this episode as evidence of Anne's age, but also Montgomery's. She had turned away from new intertextual engagement and creation, away from the modes and methods of literary construction that marked her productive years in Leesdale, and instead turned to self-preservation. At the same time, Montgomery had turned away from the vibrant, constant reading she used to do. In 1933, she says, I'd almost given up reading new books. So few of them seem worthwhile, except some histories and biographies, which are really good nowadays, much better than they used to, used to be, since biographers and historians are at last permitted to speak the truth about their subjects. But good fiction seems to have died to death. I have, in regard to fiction, got to the stage of the gentleman who said, Whenever a new book comes out, I read an old one. <laughs> <laughs> and her disdain of modern novels is well known. Her idealization of past literature, of old poetry, um, except for Agatha Christie. She loved Agatha Christie. There's an exception to that. Um, she mentions her own youth sickness. Um, in 1928, the journals were all about rereading and then recounting old memories of first reading. There's a bunch of entries that are like catalogs of things she was rereading that she read when she was younger. Um, she says in, um, she was reading an old McClure's magazine from the 1890s, and she says, I looked over it with a sudden keen realization of how the world had changed. So what had I thought about this period before? I had called it archive, and I should blame that, I guess, on the <laughs> conference theme from 2012, which was um, Ellen Montgomery, cultural memory, and it really led me down this interesting path. So the most useful terms to me that describe Montgomery's participation in the cultural phenomenon of reading are archive and scrapbook, both as nouns and verbs. Benjamin Bebb has previously connected Montgomery's stewardship of her own journals with the archive and with Derrida's idea of archive as temporary house arrest for text. And if you want to talk about Derrida's archive beaver after words, I'd love to. Um, that house arrest is a characteristic of archives that Montgomery seemed to acknowledge. I sought to extend this definition in my past work. The act of journaling is an act of archiving the self, preceded, in my view, by Montgomery's particular acts of reading as another kind of archive. It's the drawing the text to you to keep it. She copies out quotes and leaves notes in her own library, which I've paged through painstakingly and well, um, and rereads her own journals when she's typing them up in the 30s. And of course, all of this is incredibly messy. <laughs> An archive of any kind is defined by gaps, lacks, traces, remnants, things out of context and out of order, things that haunt the edges of the page, things forgotten, etc. One cannot succeed at collecting or recreating a time, a place, a person, a discussion, a reading experience. One cannot succeed at, at, at any of those things. But Charles Merriweather's introduction to a collection of essays on archives and contemporary art highlights and takes some joy in that. It says that sense of the absurd, the futile, or the impossible, which ultimately haunts the logic of the archive. I would like to think that Montgomery had some unconscious joy in the same thing. Why else recopy 10 volumes of your own life? Why else recopy short stories repeatedly? Why else reread so often? What is missing from an archive is as important as what is included, and the gaps and traces provide spaces for outside readers or viewers to give new meanings to archival objects or make important connections between cultural productions. Her reading autobiography is, like any good archive, a fascinating and frustrating tangle of text. In an essay on the rise of, the rise of archival art, like art that collects and uses found objects, Hal Foster argues that the limitations of collecting actually explain the archival impulse. He says, why else connect so feverishly if things did not appear so frightfully disconnected in the first place? Montgomery's encounters with the disconnectedness of culture, liberal, literature, experience, life, forced her to turn to the kinds of archiving at her disposal. And this reflects what so many have said about the kinds of autobiographical and archival projects Montgomery attempted. Mary Rubio says the act of writing a journal entails the shaping of raw experience. Kate Flint, a reading historian, says reading is an assertion and organization of private space. Elizabeth Eberly says, Montgomery's scrapbooks tell about her need to construct an enriching context for herself and her work. And perhaps many of Montgomery's autobiographical works can be better explained as scrapbook rather than archive anyway. 
For in order to control the inescapable chaos of reading texts and making new ones, Montgomery simply collects her thoughts. thoughts. She pastes them together in a mishmash of reminiscence. It is, as one scholar of 19th century scrapbooking calls it, writing with scissors. <laughs> it's about the meaning one makes in the choosing of an object and its removal from context to absorb it into one's own. You can make a lot of meaning in those blank spaces in the scrapbooks. Christian Boltanski, a French artist who attempted to painstakingly recreate minute by minute a whole year of his life down to descriptions of like taking the subway. He said, but he didn't succeed. Um, he said, sorry. So many years will be spent searching, studying, classifying before my life is secured, carefully arranged and labeled in a safe place, secure against fire, theft, and nuclear war. From whence it will be possible to take it out and assemble it at any point. Then, being assured of never dying, I may finally rest. And we all know that Montgomery really attempted something similar over and over again, and also that it is not really possible. But my point is that there is a lot of meaning to making to be done in that impossibility. At least still this past fall, I talked about um, some of the books that my mom and I started donating to the least still Nance. We're trying to collect uh, it won't be perfect, but a library of what Montgomery was reading in Lee's Tale and like donate the actual books. Mm -hmm. And we know that project is sort of impossible. <coughs> I'll never know exactly which ones and which editions. But I think that means I'm, we are free to see that book collection at the Nance as not just a small part of something bigger that may never come, but as a starting point um, for us to make meaning and find significance ourselves. And I think it's not no accident that archive is both the noun and the verb. It comes from the Greek arc, beginning, first place, archon, to begin with. What all this means is that I hope we can all look at Montgomery's library there and all these other messy projects as a place where we learn as much about ourselves as readers than we do about Montgomery. So, we run through those three periods. What do all these three periods show? What does revisiting all this mean? What on earth am I going to do with all this? <laughs> There are two narratives about Montgomery's work that I think this research confronts. The first narrative that I will just touch on has more to do with Montgomery's perception about writing, literature, and nature. Um, and I think what the narrative here, I don't think it's a contentious one, is that <gasps> nature is this foundational place experience in Montgomery's life of writing. And no one would disagree with me there, but I'm going to add to that. In the introduction to Ella Montgomery in the Matter of Natures, which I hope you've all purchased outside, with, uh, Rita Vogue and Jean Mitchell ha even have a heading in the introduction for approaching nature and literature to acknowledge the inseparable link between the two when looking at Montgomery's life. They link Montgomery and the Romantics and the Confederation poets who gave her some of the ideas, read some of the language to discuss nature. They go on to discuss place too, but what does Montgomery have to do with nature and place? She writes it, she reads it, she rereads it, she rewrites it. It's all text. Not only did text give her the means to express her feelings about nature, but I believe it shaped and generated her feelings about it. After all, language isn't just a means of communicating meaning, it generates meaning. So of course her feelings about the world are text-based. Anne Bertoff's forward to Paulo Freire's and Donaldo Macedo's dialogues on literacy says, language is the means to a critical consciousness, which in turn is the means of conceiving a change and of making choices to bring about further transformations. Thus, naming the world transforms reality from things in the present moment to activities in response to situations, processes to becoming. And I would argue then that that textual relationship is if not more um, important to her, at least on the same level as that spiritual connection to nature. I think her response to text is of the same magnitude. The second idea that my work may help change or confront or challenge is that it might be impossible to fully catalog Montgomery. <laughs> In an article for Canadian Children's Literature called Addicted to Reading, Ella Montgomery and the Pleasures of Reading from 1989, Clarence Carr claimed that constructing a database of Montgomery's illusions was unfeasible and perhaps even unnecessary because there would be no way to meaningfully categorize the sheer volume of references. Since that time, a real one source has done just that, or started that, and so have I. And I have been working on adding to her database of illusions as well. 
Carr's conclusion that one cannot, or perhaps should not, tackle a quantitative analysis or just listing of a reading ignores the possibilities available to those who think in terms of qualitative analysis. I sometimes hear this line of thinking um, repeated or echoed in regards to other parts of the volume of Montgomeryana out there. How will we possibly find all the short stories? Will we ever know how many times a baking of ginger snaps was reprinted? <laughs> how many of Montgomery first editions remain undiscovered? These questions seem overwhelmingly impossible to answer at first, but I think important work done by Benjamin Fed. Carolyn Strong Collins, my late mother, among many, many others in this room, is proving just the opposite. That in searching for and tracking down the bits and pieces of these large questions, we learned so much more than just the quantitative. It is exciting to me that there is so much more to learn, no matter how daunting it may seem. And just a preview, the database is happening. This is, this is a very lame photo, so it's a bit more exciting. <laughs> <laughs> Is Donald's in here? I had a wonderful, there he said, wonderful Skype conversation with Donald's in March, and we were talking about how to make this initial research available. And I have a few thousand reading references in a much messier Excel spreadsheet. <laughs> much messier, more for me. But Donald and I talked about making this um, really flat so it can be cross referenced, and it, it, we will be working in some time in the near future on making this available and making it searchable and cross-referenceable. And um, I'm really gonna need all of your help. It's gonna be based on a lot of my research, but I'm hoping that the database can have an add more button where you can submit an illusion that is mixed, an illusion that is maybe unconscious on Montgomery's part. This is just the first little tiny piece where you can see here is the first few pages of the complete journals and the first couple pensy letters um, that I've noted a few things about. So the database is happening. In a chapter on reading in the Victorians, Rosalind Crone challenges critics who question the usefulness of the UK RIT, the UK Reading Experience Database. Begun in 1995, with multiple updates since then, um, the UK RIT is a series of linked databases cataloging the reading experiences of thousands of British readers. It drew from library borrowing records, manuscript diaries, newspaper references, um, even prison records, but focuses on what they define as reading experiences, meaning recorded engagements with text beyond just possession. So it wouldn't be just book sales, it'd be more than that. And it's meant to provide a large scale, scale view of reading and print culture in the UK in the 19th century. And just a side note, it attributes more reading experiences to Walter Scott than any other person between 1800 and 1900. No one's surprised. The UK Red can be used to study socioeconomic status, literacy levels, connections between readers and publishing, and so on. And Crone says, so far I have presented a great deal of data from the UK Red, and yet it feels so un unsatisfactory. She wonders if the data in the Red is too small or too repetitive. Does it say anything we don't already know? And she says, perhaps it's useless because it will never be finished. And it will be impossible to finish, just like I think some people will assume Montgomery's reading database is impossible to finish. But Chrome provides me with a new model. She says, it is very tempting at this point to highlight the value that lies within the individual records of the UK read, to stress the need to look at sources deeply, and so encourage a return to business as usual, namely to the production of studies of reading which focus on individual readers, or tightly defined reading communities, or single reading references, using sets of sources with tight methodologies to construct these and comparing results to understanding reading culture in the 19th century. And Crone says, such a path would reduce the value of UK Red to a mere index, pointing researchers towards sources. So as I mentioned previously, I'm interested in more than source study, and as interesting as that can be. And Crone says, the application of quantitative methods of analysis to qualitative data and vice versa can be unsatisfactory. And in the case of UK Red, which contains data that is so richly textured and gathered from such diverse sources, it might be wholly inappropriate. Instead, she suggests we do things like this. This is an image that she pulled from UK Red and is built using what's called social network analysis. And that's not to be confused with social media analysis. This existed, social networks existed before Facebook. And they have this is social network analysis. Um, she says, um, 
Okay. Um, she says that um, this highlights uh, the highlighting of links between debt rather than counting it, not just counting means, not just like counting titles or genres of Montgomery's reading, might provide some clues as to a way forward. In other words, we need to find a way of transforming textual data into a dynamic and flexible three-dimensional model of reading culture in the Victorian period, that's her speaking. And this is um, noting where readers of Lay of the Last Minstrel also read Lady of the Lake and or Marmion. And you can find the, the connections. And there's a lot, I don't want to have time going to this here, but social network analysis, there's terms for how this is designed. These are all different nodes and how they're connected. And they, this is actually way richer in meaning than it might appear. She says, social network modeling and analysis will not solve problems inherent in using an array of different sources for data harvesting, just like Montgomery's um, reading autobiography. But it does have the potential to refocus our approach to shift us away from the search for essentially quantitative patterns to looking at relationships between texts and readers. In other words, it can provide us both this bird's eye view and a, a granular view of individual episodes of Montgomery's reading. We can visualize and reinterpret connections and correlations between different reading experiences. Now, I've done the very tippest of the tip of the iceberg with this. We can do things like this. Now, this is based on just, just the first 20 entries in the complete journal. And what you can see, this, this is a tiniest little slice, but I was looking at places where she alluded or quoted something versus she reflected on that reading. Notice she quotes from poetry more often, but she reflects on both novels, poetry, and recitation pieces about equal weight. That's just the first 20 entries in the journal. Now imagine with my 3,000. Um, we also do, let me get one more here. Yeah, this is, and the, the text is very small. I was using a very uh, user-friendly uh, graphing program called Raw Data, so I can just pick fonts. So this is the, this circle is places where the editor notes in the journal indicate a quote or allusion. This one um, are things that are kind of mentioned offhandedly, different places, like it's a sort of editor's note or something she had to perform. <laughs> These ones are things she alluded to or quoted without any uh, commentary, and these ones she read and reflected on. This is in the first few hundred F um, entries in the journal. Notice, she, again, she memorized a heck of a lot of poetry. Yes. You see that here. And then she reflected on novel reading more than other types of reading. Again, this is the tiniest little slice of what we can do. So given this um, social network analysis, we can ask questions like, what genres of text did Montgomery read most often? And quickly get results. We can ask, when she cited the French gentian, were other texts mentioned alongside it? Did she read more or less in the winter? I have dates attached to all of this. Was she more likely to record reading responses to certain kinds of texts in certain environments? Which texts are most often mentioned together? We can find that too. Um, I'll go back to my day later. <laughs> Right, so that's what he's doing. Um, but I, I noted like which text is, it's quoted in, you know, under what circumstances, what page number, and everything. So the database, what I imagine, as mentioned, is a full and complete as possible record of reading with help from you all to find things that I know I will miss. Okay? And I have lots of plans to get through that. And but I, but I think what is really encouraging about that database is, as my husband said earlier, it's no fun to be done looking. <laughs> and we're not done, so it won't be done. And I'm okay that it's not going to be done because we still can find out a lot about the reading. What I find most amazing about all of this is that it will take all of us, all of our lifetimes, to complete what she did alone in hers. Wow.
questions? No questions. Oh, I think everyone's blown away. Yeah. <laughs> um, I am super into data and the things that people do with data, so I love what you do. Great. Because I know that that took a long, long time, and how exciting it could be to glean new information from mm -hmm. just analyzing the data. Mm -hmm. um, I'm wondering if you think it would be cool maybe next year to make an uh, interactive network. A social network board that has all of um, Element Lily works and then maybe thread or um, yarn that we can kind of make a map. Oh, like if you're talking about physical. Yeah, yeah, I'm thinking like mm -hmm. all of us in this room could say what works we've read and then what works yeah. each other we've read. Let's so, like, talk about you and I and Don will talk afterwards. <laughs> <laughs> I can find the yarn. That sounds, that's amazing. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds amazing. <laughs> Um, how close to the series? Um, I like their writers not only did not do a book journal, I do a listing of all the books you're writing about. Do it. Like, yeah. That's a good question. I, I really don't know. I wonder to one on one hand, I wonder if she looked at her journal as a little bit of that record, but also her I don't know if she thought that linearly, that's a word. Um there's records of her reading in so many places. You know, I've been through um, all of the books in her library of wealth and paged through every page, every single one. And there's notes and pastes and all sorts of things in there. So there's a little bit there. There's a little bit in the journals. There's a little bit in the fiction. There's a little bit in the essays. There's you know essays on her reading and her my favorite bookshelf and so on. I wonder if she didn't think that was necessary. But and also you know in the letters too to McMillan as Beth mentioned, there's a lot of that recording. I, I wonder though. I mean, I just don't think she was that. I mean, she was fastidious, but not in the way I would be. <laughs> like, you know, her clippings, her clippings journal are kind of a, a tangle of mess. There's no bibliographic data. Her trade notes and all those things are so mess, and they're, they're all over the place. And her journaling was such a mess. I don't think she ever thought in that sort of chronological way. And I think we talk about that a lot. She never, she didn't do things on chronological time. She did on like chirotic time, like the relevant moment, not the next one. Yeah. Well, she talks a lot about rereading from here, um, different things. And I'm, I'm particularly um, aware of her reading The Rise and Fall of the World of Three times. She talks about reading three or four times. Do you think she read, do you think she read every word of these things or just skipped it, skipped it around or read parts or I think thought I'm, she had read them? Sure, sure. <laughs> I, I'm tempted to say that she was an incredibly skilled reader and probably did reread closely everything. I don't, I mean, obviously I have no way of knowing that. But my temptation is to say, in order to read the amount she read and speak of it so eloquently, she has to be an incredibly careful reader. Hmm. The reading Rise and Fall of the Roman Empire three times, though, so that's a gross mistake. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe two. Yeah. 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 Okay. And she read. So it could be, it could be she's saying how fast on memory read, three or four books a day, which could mean on one hand she's an incredibly skilled reader and can absorb it all, or maybe is missing pieces. I, I don't know. That's a good question. Yeah, that's well, I was just gonna say I think that there there may be two things. She may have been a whole page reader. Mm -hmm. And I haven't encountered those people who don't years ago, they read a whole page, not skim it, but they actually see it as a whole, like a whole page. Some <laughs> people I know actually read two pages at the same time, which is why um, <laughs> I'd be really interested in like how that figures into how she built her scrapbooks. Yeah. She's seeing the whole lot of parts. Yeah. I have a, I have a question though. Um, I was wondering if you get any sense. I do get sense about all kinds of things. Um, that the Cavendish Lindsay Library, that you'll ever actually have an idea of what was in that. Mm -hmm. I'm, I, I don't know, that's a good question. I could probably recreate a good chunk of it, but it would be the Montgomery focused chunk. So I would suspect that certain, well, I don't know if she read everything, but I wonder if certain kinds of books I'd be missing. You know, I'd be, I would have all the romance and the poetry and the history and the 
but none of the, if I can't even think of anything she would skip, but there's probably some things she maybe wouldn't have talked about. Um, she doesn't talk about Thoreau. We hear Thoreau in a lot of her writing, she never mentions it. Now, I'm not a fan of Thoreau, so I understand why she would do that. <laughs> but he's there, but he's not there. And so, yeah, I'm sure I missed some interesting things. Saying, well, I only read it three or four times. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> but the second thing, as Mary just mentioned, was the intellectual capacity of her sons and interests. And um, I found it interesting because you cataloged the, uh, the remaining existing personal library that she has. A lot of the maybe uh, lesser mm -hmm. fiction <laughs> is not present. Because that got perhaps distributed or sold. And that was what the I went through all of her egg of Christmas. But the um, this rise and fall of the Roman Empire has Cameron McDonald's name inscribed in it. So he kept it. It was a book of value for him. It stated three or four weeks after the death, in fact, he wrote his name, Cameron McDonald, and a date. So he right away kept <coughs> some of her books by mm -hmm. his because of his connection to the mm -hmm. And that's a that's another paper in itself of what that personal library we have well is, you know, how to define it and describe where it came from and find the provenance of each volume or something. Right. Mm -hmm. I know there's other questions out there, but I'm really conscious of time, and I'm the person that's been tasked with keeping everyone's time. And I just want to say thank you to Emily. Oh, she's oh. One of our members who wanted to remain anonymous went over to market this morning and got these flowers for oh. Emily. <laughs> 